What was the first shiny Pokemon that you ever caught? And I'm not talking about the Red Gyarados in Generation 2. I bet that that Pokemon holds special significance for you even now to this day. And for me, the first shiny that I ever caught was a Swinub. So today I'm really excited to do a playthrough with this evolutionary line. Let's get into it. Here are the rules for today's challenge, and I've also left them in the description so that you can reference them later. However, today I'm also going to make several other major changes to how I do playthroughs in Generation 2. It's a new year after all, and I've been playing these challenges in Gen 2 for over a year now, and I want to make things more interesting. Here are the adjustments that I'm making. Held items are allowed, rare candies are allowed whenever I want, I can save between League members, I'll play all the challenges in Pokemon Crystal, I'll track real time, game time, resets, and level, I'll track these metrics at League completion and when I defeat Red, I won't give myself any egg moves or event moves at the start, I played around with this idea but decided against it in the end. There are also some moves that I specifically need to address, and these are Return, Hidden Power, and Curse, as well as the combos of Sleep Talk and Rest and Rollout and Defense Curl. After much deliberation, I've decided to allow myself to continue to use these moves. I'm just going to play the game in the way that I believe will allow me to beat it in the fastest, most consistent way. Finally, I'll play the game on 4 times game speed instead of my previous 3 times game speed. Let me explain why I've decided to make this change. At the root of it is that I really just want to be able to produce more videos for all of you, and I also made the first decision to play on 3 times game speed for a sort of weird and arbitrary reason. I limited myself in this way because I honestly just couldn't navigate the Generation 2 menu well enough at 4 times game speed. Like, I kept selecting the wrong items and my cursor just moved around way too fast. It's actually different in Generation 1, it feels a little bit clunkier, uh, obviously. So really, the 3 times game speed is only limiting me from producing more videos, and it's not actually adding any quality. But making this change does mean something, and there's a reason that I put it off for so long. Because I'm changing the game speed that I play at, my old tier list isn't going to be particularly relevant anymore. But that's okay, it's actually filled with forgotten Pokémon anyways. Uh, except for you, Stantler, huh? You got an evolution. Well done. I use the Universal Pokémon Randomizer to replace Chikorita with Swinub. If you want to play a Pokémon challenge like this yourself, I've left a link to the software in the description. Swinub takes 2 times damage from all of the starters, so I had to consider which starter I wanted my rival to pick. In these challenges, I try to give him the Pokémon that's going to be hardest for me to face. So here are the factors that I considered when making this decision. My little ice ground pig has stab damage against grass in the form of ice moves and stab damage against fire types in the form of ground moves. Water resists its ice attacks and takes neutral damage from its ground attacks. So that would suggest that Totodile is the best starter for the rival to take. However, I don't think that that's the case, because Cyndaquil is usually harder. This is because later in the game it actually gets better fire moves, whereas Feraligatr only gets Water Gun until the final rival fight that I play in the challenges. One thing to note is that Swinup gets access to its first ground type move in the form of Mud Slap after Faulkner, and that's only 20 base power. But it gets access to its first ice move, which is super effective against grass types, basically at level 10, so right at the start. So that's the reason I thought the rival having Cyndaquil would be slightly harder than the rival having Chikorita. Now I'm going to address another aspect of my challenges, and that's that I play these with near-perfect DVs. I'm interested in speedy completion of the game, so I'm using Pokémon that are basically like genetic perfection. I also feel that this makes it fairest at the end when I compare their results in a tier list. Now I did say near-perfect DVs for a reason, and that's because I set my DVs so that hidden power is the type that I want. Swinub has a single weakness to fire, water, grass, fighting, steel, and no double weaknesses, so that's really nice. This cute little frozen pig's ice type covers its grass weakness, its ground type covers both fire and steel weaknesses, and that only leaves water and fighting remaining. I'm choosing to cover its fighting weakness with Hidden Power Psychic because I'm more scared of Chuck or Bruno than I am of Misty. I can't believe that I just said that. I'm scared of Bruno. Also, I considered Hidden Power Flying because Swinub has better attack than it has special attack. However, in Generation 1 and 2, the HP DV is actually calculated based on the other DVs, and getting Hidden Power Flying just really does a number on my health, so I didn't think that that was a good option. It's too bad that my coverage move against fighting types is only going to be using my special attack. Oh well. With the Mr. Pokemon quest out of the way, I arrive at Sprout Tower, and in here the Bellsprout are actually doing more damage to me than I was hoping for. My dual typing of Ice and Ground allows their grass type attacks to do decent damage to me. And then this Bellsprout takes me all the way down to red health, and the trainer has one more left over. I was so sure that I was going to get knocked out here. And then I used Tackle, and it got a critical hit and knocked the third Bellsprout out in a single hit. I was so happy moving on from this fight without a reset. So that's one lucky win under my belt. I decide to train up a little bit outside of the tower in order to learn Powder Snow, and with it on my side for super effective damage, I head back to the tower to finish off the remaining sages. 
The final one though is actually pretty scary. His level 7 Bellsprout are doing a lot of damage with their neutral vine whips. When Hootoot came out, I was really not sure if I could win. It hits me with tackle, but Swineup survives with 2 hit points and knocks the bird out. So that's the second close call for me in this run. I really hope that Faulkner isn't going to be the third. It's time to take on the majestic mud slapping birds. Let's do it. He opens with Pidgey. I choose Powder Snow and it knocks it out in a single hit. Pidgeotto follows. I'm doing enough damage for this to be a two hit, and after a pathetic gust, I take an easy first gym victory. As a prize, Faulkner gives me the TM for Mudslap, and this move can be learnt by so many Pokemon in this generation. However, today it's even better than it normally is. It gets the same type attack bonus because I'm a ground type, so it ends up with 30 power and a 99.6% chance to lower the target's accuracy. Yes, in Gen 2 it's not 100% sure that you're going to lower their accuracy. An additional benefit to having beaten Faulkner is that his badge gives your attack stat a 12.5% boost. This isn't visible within the summary page of the Pokemon, so it's only calculated when you're in battle and you actually never have access to see the effect that this boost has on your stats. As you may have noticed, I'm now including the Pokemon's current stats in the chart at the bottom left when I'm facing gym leaders or other important trainers throughout the run. For clarity, these stats will include the boosts given by each badge, and to denote which badge boost I'm receiving at a particular time, I've placed that badge next to the stat so that you can tell. Now, while I've been explaining badge boosts in Generation 2, you've been watching some footage of me struggling to catch a bell sprout. Honestly, this was so painful in this playthrough. It's my HM Mule for Cut and Flash, and normally I get it right before I enter Violet City, but today none showed up and I just decided to proceed without it. However, Swineup's typing and low special defense makes catching one a complete nightmare. I failed my first attempt, I ran out of balls on my second attempt, for once it's the balls, not the PP. I gave up on that area and tried the next area, which is objectively a bad idea because the Bellsprout here are level 7. The third one that I'm facing uses growth twice and I don't want to mess with that so I ran away. Finally on my fourth encounter I finally catch myself one. In previous playthroughs I have caught Paris in the forest instead of taking a Bellsprout here, but they're much rarer so I just don't like that option that much. Outside of Union Cave I save, I use the Repel that I picked up on the previous route to navigate through here without any encounters, and then Hiker Anthony stops me on the other side. The Geodude's easy to knock out, but unfortunately Machop knows Low Kick. In this generation it's a 50 base power move with a chance to flinch, and it completely wrecks Swine Up. So that's my first reset of this run. On my way back through the cave, I train a little bit in case I have to fight Anthony again. But this time I skip him and I can proceed to the rocket plotline. They're all going to be easy. With that out of the way, I train on the bug catchers in the gym and I prepare myself for Bugsy's Scyther. Ice and ground type doesn't resist bug attacks, so Fury Cutter is still a threat. Powder Snow has a chance to freeze though, so that's a nice thing working in my favor. I think I should be fine here. Let's find out. Bugsy sends out Metapod first and Powder Snow isn't doing much to it because Bug isn't weak to ice. It takes 3 turns to faint and then Kakuna's is up next. 3 turns against this one is worse because it can poison me. But luckily I freeze it on second turn. Unfortunately I can't take advantage of this freeze with any setup moves so I just have to knock it out and move on to the Scyther. But luckily I didn't get poisoned. Earlier in the fight when I was facing Metapod I actually realized that I forgot to equip a berry so I'm actually kind of worried now. Scyther uses quick attack and it does just under 1 quarter damage. Powder Snow does one third, and Scyther continues its quick attack. For some reason it just really doesn't want to use Fury Attack. Okay. But even with quick attack it takes me all the way down to 5 hit points before I knock it out. So that's the third close call of this run. Swineup is having a lot of these. Is this going to continue? The second rival fight is next and I'm lucky that I have Stab Mudslap here. It doesn't quite knock the Ghastly out, but it does miss Lick. Okay, that's good. He sends out Quilava next because the AI in these games regularly sends out the Pokemon that's super effective against yours. It hits Ember and does half damage to me. My Mudslap connects, lowers its accuracy, and then it misses its next Ember. Okay, that's great. And then my second Mudslap fails to lower its accuracy. Remember when I said it isn't guaranteed in this generation? Yeah, worst possible moment for that to happen. Quilava hits me with Ember, and I faint. So I think that I need more levels to make this more consistent. I want to be out of two hit range. I'm heading back to Union Cave in order to do this training. This takes a while though because I'm pretty over leveled at this point and everything in here is like level 6. At level 19 I try again and Ghastly immediately paralyzes me with Lick. Okay so that teaches me that I should be holding a paralyzed cure berry for this fight. Because of that Quilava has no problems finishing me off. I try again with the berry and this time I don't need it because Ghastly doesn't paralyze me. Quilava comes out next. 
it uses ember, and it burns me. Well, this just feels hopeless now. That cuts my attack stat, and it's going to prevent Mudslot from doing good damage. Unless I get a massive critical hit like that, and then I finish it off. Zubat is all that remains. Is it possible for me to win this one? I use Powder Snow, but the bat survives. I take burn damage, tank its bite, surviving with 8 hit points, and finish it off. That's unbelievably lucky, and that's the fourth incredibly close fight that Swineub's had. In the forest I grab Headbutt, and this is a nice upgrade for Tackle, as it will allow me to leverage Swineub's attack stat more. Plus, the 30% chance to flinch is great. It's saved me in so many runs in the past. However, even with this great move on my side, Swineup now has an issue. Whitney. Miltank has Rollout, and while Ground-type resists Rock, Ice is weak to it, so it's going to be doing neutral damage. I could just cross my fingers and wait for Powder Snow to freeze, but I really don't like that idea. Instead, I decide to fight trainers between Azalea Town and Goldenrod in order to level up. After that, I grab the Coin Case and buy myself an Abra. It's going to be useful once I get to Kanto. North of Goldenrod, I obtain Kenya, my flying mule, and then once again, I train in preparation for Whitney. While I was doing this training, I had a question lingering in my mind, and that's how does the AI work in these games? I found a lot of documentation on how the Generation 1 AI works, but not on how the Generation 2 AIs work. So if you have any resources explaining it, please leave it in the comments below for me so that I can read up on it. Without that info, I just don't know if Whitney is going to be choosing Rollout or not, so I'm going in kind of blind. Let's see how it goes. She leads with Clefairy, and it only takes two hits to knock it out. Okay, that's not too bad. Miltank is next, and I wasn't really clear on what my plan should be here. Like, it's very painfully obvious when you watch the footage. First turn, I select Powder Snow. Miltank uses Rollout, so I know that that's on the table now. And then my Powder Snow hits and doesn't do very much damage. On the next turn, it hits me for massive damage with Stomp, and then my Powder Snow connects, but I don't get a freeze. I tank a hit from Rollout, and then I decide to start setting up with Mud Slap. But it's too late. On the next fight, I decide to start things off with Mud Slap to lower Miltank's accuracy right away. And honestly, I feel sort of obligated to cheese Whitney because she was so painful to face when I was a kid. But it doesn't work, and again I faint. So I guess the pain of my childhood is now like coming back to me later in life. Instead of bashing my head against this wall more, I'm gonna head north and train in National Park until I'm level 26. I give Swine of the Quick Claw and attempt again. But the cow is still too strong. I'm surprised honestly because usually Whitney doesn't give me too many troubles in these challenges. I try one more fight, but this time Attract convinces me that there isn't a way forward without additional training. Or insane luck. It hurts to grind in the wild in Johto, but that's what I'm gonna have to do. Every two levels I'll reattempt Whitney and see if that makes a difference. I don't want to overtrain because that'll waste a lot of real time. At level 28, I decide that I'm getting too fancy with Mud Slap, and instead I just start to use Powder Snow. However, after one hit, I realized that the 30% chance to flinch is probably more reliable. I was thinking about getting a freeze status here, but I think that the flinch is actually better. Spamming headbutt's all that I need, and my tiny ice pig takes the victory in this showdown of farm animals. So that came faster than I expected. Now, an unofficial rule of these playthroughs is that I need to defeat the Sudowoodo. I know that I can run away from these obstacle Pokemon, but that really doesn't feel like it's in the spirit of these games and the series in general. Today, it's easy because Mudslap is super effective, and it ruins Low Kick's already imperfect accuracy. Next are the Kimono Girls. They give good experience, and I usually talk about that here, but Swineup is part of the slow experience group, so it's actually leveling up slower than most of my other Pokemon. That means that at this point in the game, I've actually spent more time training than I regularly would have, and that's really impacting the real time that it's taken me to get to here. And then another factor impacting the real time that I spend on this playthrough is Umbreon, and I get into a really frustrating staring match because of Sand Attack. Accuracy lowering moves are really my least favorite thing about Pokemon. I end up defeating it without any issues, it just took me a while. Ugh. The third rival fights next. I outspeed the Haunter and do great damage with Mud Slap. It's already pre-selecting Curse, so it drains all of its remaining health and then faints. As an additional benefit here, Curse doesn't do any damage the turn the opponent's Pokemon faints, so I'm moving on to Quilava unscathed. But this is where all hope is lost. Mud Slap doesn't do much, Curse inflicts damage, and Quilava connects with an absolutely brutal Ember. On the next turn, my swine up gets knocked out. I try the fight again immediately after, and it seems like it's like right after for you, and you might think like, what did I think was different? Well actually, I just went and ate lunch, and then when I got back, I uh, forgot how brutal the rival was. Haunter plays out as it did before, but this time Quilava doesn't. It misses its second ember, allowing me to proceed to the Magnemite. Mudslap does 4 times damage, and it takes the Steel Electric type out with a single hit. Now all I need to do is knock the Zubat out with one hit from Powder Snow. 
but it doesn't quite faint. However, it freezes the bat, and this just teases me because then the curse damage finishes me off anyways. I think I'm going to need more levels in order to get past this fight, and the lighthouse is just around the corner, so I'll take care of it now. I've got an apology to deliver there anyways. In Olivine City, I catch a Krabby. By the way, I won't be catching the uh, Chin Chow here that I used to use for Waterfall. There's actually a faster way to get a Waterfall user in Pokemon Crystal. I'll show that off later. Then I grab the HM for Strength. Some of you mentioned that there's leftovers in this building, but that's actually only in the remakes, so I can't get access to that item here. After that, I'm off to the Lighthouse to train. Swineup's slow experience group really makes this grind slow, but I'm approaching level 33 and I'm going to get a big buff after evolution. Near the top of the tower, I make the important apology to Dennis. I forgot to mention you in my Celebi video, I'm really sorry man. By the way, Dennis has a Fero as his ace, and so I'm going to use this Pokemon in a Yellow Versus video in the next few weeks. Stay tuned. The experience from all the trainers in the tower allows me to reach level 33 actually at the last trainer that I fight in here, and then Swine Up evolves into Pilo Swine. With my pig all powered up, I'm heading back to Ecruteague City to face the rival again. For this footage, I'm going to play my live reactions from when I was filming this playthrough, so here it is. Okay, here we go. Rival 3 with a Pilo Swine. Haunter. Oh. Forgot to heal. <laughs> well, I one hit it anyways, so that's good. Well. This quite possibly could be the funniest way to win a fight. Huh. Oh. Well, it's way easier when I've leveled up and I've evolved. Morty's next, and I have a plan for him. On the way to Olivine City, I picked up a mint berry, so having Piloswine hold it will allow it to wake up in case he manages to connect hypnosis. However, I completely forgot to do this last minute, so I just don't have a berry. Four times game speed is hard. Everything just goes by so quick and it's so easy to forget things. Lucky for me, Piloswine outspeeds the first Ghastly, preventing it from using Curse. After that, I knock out both Haunter and a single hit each. Gengar is last. I do good damage to it, taking it into orange health, and then it uses Hypnosis, connects, and my pig falls asleep. Gengar starts to use Dream Eater, but luckily for me, Generation 2 brought some good changes to sleep mechanics, and I wake up, strike back with Mudslap, and take the victory. Next time though, Mint Berry. Now I have a choice, Chuck or Price next, and the answer is fairly obvious, Price. At the Lake of Rage there are a lot of great items, a rare candy, an elixir, the TM for Detect, which Pilos Wine actually learns, the TM for Hidden Power, and remember that this is a psychic type move for today's playthrough because of how I set my DVs at the start. Now it's time for the Red Gyarados, and following my unofficial rules, I'm going to defeat it today. And it's easy with Headbutt. The Rocket Hideout's next. At 4 times speed, this place feels so much more manageable, like, for my emotions. It was seriously dull when I was playing at 3 times speed. I think that going forward I'll just like tell little stories about my experiences with Pokemon when I'm in here, uh, something to fill the time. I could just cut this footage entirely, but then you don't get an accurate feeling for the length of time that I need to be down here. And uh, really, uh, we have to share this pain together. So today I'll just point out how terribly positioned Lance's free heal is if you actually know what you're doing. He heals you after exactly three battles. Oh well, uh, there's only seven more mandatory battles left, and that's counting the three electrode that I need to knock out at the end. Funnily enough, when I was facing them today, Mudslap lowers their accuracy, and because of this, when the second two self-destruct, they both miss. I found this really funny. So that's a great way to wrap up the hideout. Now it's time for Price, and I chose to face him before Chuck because, well, Chuck is super effective against my Ice type, but also I want the TM for Icy Wind. It's not really a great ice move because it has less than 100% accuracy, and you know, if it's not 100% accurate, it's uh, you know the rest. But it has a higher base power than Powder Snow, which I think is really going to help make up for Piloswine's lowish special attack stat. In this fight against him, I'll be taking neutral damage from ice attacks and two times damage from water attacks, so I honestly don't match up very well here. I use Headbutt against Seal, it almost faints, retaliates with Icy Wind, and lowers my speed. I knock it out and move on to Dugong. Here's where things start to get annoying. It's really tanky and Headbutt isn't doing as much as I hoped it would. I get the Dugong down to low health, and then it uses Rest and heals. Because it's asleep, I decide to use Mud Slap to ruin its accuracy, and this pays off allowing me to take it down. Pile of Swine is next, the mirror match. I could use a neutrally effective Powder Snow here, but instead I choose to set up a couple Mud Slaps first. Unfortunately, I went too fast, and I used the second one after Piloswine set up Mist. I start headbutting, and it's doing a decent amount of damage. And then Price selects Blizzard, but it misses. 
Whew, my single mud slap is really paying off. Quite honestly, this fight took a lot longer than was expected. I'm not used to this being a grind. I earn the TM for Icy Wind and I teach it to Pile Swine right away in the place of Endure. I'll get access to Ice Beam after the Elite Four when the Tutor shows up in Goldenrod City and then that'll be my go-to move. For Chuck's Gym, I replace Headbutt with Hidden Power, and I'm going to upgrade from Hidden Power to Return in the near future, so it just makes sense to use a single move slot for all of these changes. Before I get to the Gym Leader though, I have to face the Tag Team Trainers. Hitmonlee is first and Hidden Power Psychic doesn't do the job. Lack of stab and poor special attack is really to blame. It connects with the Jump Kick, but I tank it pretty well. The following Hitmonchan isn't as much of an issue because it has the Elemental Punches and Comet Punch. Quite bad moves for a Hitmonchan in Gen 2. Nob is the next trainer, and he's got a scary Machoke. I'm lucky that my ground typing makes this Rock Slide neutrally effective against me. However, Hidden Power Psychic knocks out both of his Pokemon in a single hit, so I never have to face the Rock Slide anyways. For Chuck, I finally remember to equip my Mint Berry. I guess saving it until here is actually a fine strategy if you aren't worried about Morty. Plus, I think I'm dead if he connects with a Dynamic Punch, so I'm not using a Bitter Berry for that reason. Hidden Power 1 hits the Primeape, Polyrath's next. I use Hidden Power, do over half damage, it takes aim, and because I'm outspeeding, I get off another attack and take an easy victory. Now it's time for Jasmine, and I think that Pyloswine is well prepared for her. Mudslap can hopefully one hit the Magnemite, and then I can use Icy Wind against the Steelix. I'm really proud that I'm not getting seduced by the super effective Mudslap. It's base 20 power, so 30 power after stab, and 60 power after getting super effective damage against Steelix. But Icy Wind is neutral and gets stab, giving it 82.5 power, and most importantly, it's a special move. And Steelix lacks special defense. Let's try it. Magnemite's first, and Mud Slap gets the job done. Steelix is next. I use Icy Wind, it does a good amount of damage, and the snake connects with Iron Tail for just over half damage. Luckily for me, Steelix misses its next attack, Jasmine uses a Hyper Potion, and then at the critical moment, I get a critical hit. I clean up the final Magnemite, and now I'm heading back to Goldenrod. I pick up the TM for Return, and then I go head to head with the Rockets in Radio Tower. All of this culminates in a strangely refreshing battle against this Rocket Admin. So, the first coughing uses smokescreen, absolutely ruining my accuracy, and uh, making me very happy in the process. Weezing comes out and then uses explosion, knocking Pylos Wine out. I didn't save since before Jasmine, so I actually have to fight her again. That's a decent amount of time lost just because the rocket leader caught me off guard. Normally he's not a challenge. Luckily for me, Jasmine goes almost identically to the first fight. This time I get a critical hit against Steelix earlier on in the fight though. For the rocket boss, this time I prepare better. Return is a powerful 100% accuracy physical move, and a poison cure berry just in case a status condition happens. Also, I save right in front of him. Things don't start off well. Each of the first two coughings uses smoke screen. <sighs> After that, Piloswine levels up and starts to learn mist. Oh, so this might actually be a good option for this fight if I fail again. But for now I'll skip it, just because my accuracy is like already trash. Weezing comes out, I was terrified of an explosion, but it just uses Tackle and I knock it out. I make my way through the rest of the remaining coughing and that's it. The fourth rival fight takes place in the underground. He's so easy here. A lot of you commented about how this fight is actually telling a story. His approach to raising Pokemon without love and only because he wants to win is like not making his Pokemon as good as they could be, so that's why he has poor move sets and he's really underleveled. I actually really like this idea, I think it's pretty cool. After that, I finish off the rocket plotline, and I'm finally ready to proceed to Ice Path. So, Swinub's visiting its home, and because of that, it gets a present, in the form of the Never Melt Ice. This held item boosts the power of Ice-type attacks by 10%. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, this item was actually buffed in Generation 4, and now it raises Ice-type attacks by 20% instead of 10 it's pretty good game design that I get access to it here, because up next are Claire's Dragonairs. However, I'm not really worried about them. The real issue in this coming fight is Kingdra, because I don't have anything that's super effective against it. Also, it's infamous for its trolley strategies with Smokescreen, and that does worry me. However, what I'm really concerned about is Surf and how much damage it's going to do. Okay, I can't delay any longer. Let's do this. Claire opens with a level 37 Dragonair. I use Icy Wind, and it's a one hit. Next, she sends out Kingdra. Okay, this is the moment of truth. Return does half damage, it uses Surf, 
I survive, and then I knock it out. Okay, so that was easy. All I need to do is clean up the remaining dragon airs. Fingers crossed that Icy Wind doesn't miss. Okay, it hits once, and it hits a second time. Okay, with that, I'm going to prove myself in the dragon's den. Once you've answered all these questions and left the building, you can actually come back and receive a Dratini from the Elder. Now, this only works in Pokemon Crystal and in the remakes, so if you're playing Gold and Silver, you're out of luck. And from today forward, this Dratini is going to be my Waterfall user. It's always there, it's convenient, it's consistent, and it doesn't take extra time. It's so great when you can find a gift Pokemon that can also serve as an HM Mule. I collect rare candies next, and on the way, I pick up an important item, the soft sand. It's south of Goldenrod in this little hidden area at the end of this strip of water. You have to fight three trainers to obtain it, and once that's done, talk to the final trainer again and she'll give it to you. I journey to Victory Road, and here I obtain the TM for Earthquake. So this is becoming quite the combo. Piloswine is going to be a complete beast. High attack, soft sand, and stab Earthquake. I'm feeling really confident for the league, and this confidence really shows because I completely stomped the final rival here. Here are my stats and moveset before the league. Do you think I can do it, or is Piloswine gonna struggle? Let's find out. Will is first, and against him, I'm gonna talk about ground type moves in the Johto League. And this might initially sound contradictory to what I just said about being confident with Piloswine, but that's not the case. So, ground type moves in the Johto League really aren't that good. Zatu is a flying type, and there are two of them on Will's team. Koga's ace, Crobat, is a flying type too. Karen has a Murkrow, and Lance's entire team are flying types. Uh, that's why he's Faulkner's father. However, in this case, Piloswine is very lucky. Ice type complements its ground type perfectly, allowing it to take care of all of the flyers with stab damage as well. The decision to make here is really just which item do I want to take into the fight. Against almost all of the trainers, I think that Nevermelt Ice makes sense. Earthquake is already so powerful just because of its base power, and so this item helps boost Icy Wind's low damage and helps make up for Piloswine's mediocre special attack. By the way, as the will fight wraps up, I just realized that Piloswine is a pig, and uh, that's probably why it's a ground type, because pigs like to roll around in the mud. Kogus next. There's nothing on his team that scares me. And just a little reminder now that I'm saving between League members, if I get stuck, I'll either use Rare Candies or Blackout and Train in Victory Road. One thing I noticed with not saving is that it can skew a Pokemon's results a lot. If one Pokemon struggles against Lance and the other one struggles against Will, the Pokemon that's struggling against Lance is going to be massively disadvantaged in the real-time metric. This is because it'll have to defeat Will, Koga, Bruno, and Karen over and over in order to get back to Lance just to try again. Instead, if the Pokemon can save, then use Rare Candies, reattempt, switch up its moveset, and do this all without reattempting, it can make it past its challenging League members with less arbitrary time baggage added. Bruno's next, and uh, he could be scary today because of his Machamp's Cross Chop. While writing this script, I realized that Soft Sand is likely the best held item for this fight, because I'm really not going to be using Icy Wind very much. With it, I'll do more damage with Earthquake, and maybe that would bring the Machamp within KO range, However, in this fight it survives, uses Cross Chop, and it misses. Thankfully, fighting moves have trash accuracy, so I defeat him on my first attempt. All is right with the world. Karen is next, and for this fight I'm going to take in a Paralyzed Cure Berry. I want it specifically for the Vile Plume in case I don't knock it out, and then it uses Stun Spore. Umbreon fails its first turn sand attack, and I even considered using Mud Slap there to make that a more likely event. I use Earthquake against the Vile Plume because it has lower physical defense, and Icy Wind ends up being around the same power, but my special attack is lower. However, the Flower survives, uses Stun Spore as predicted, but it misses, and I knock it out, so I didn't need my berry this time. Houndoom's next. It outspeeds, uses Flamethrower, and does so much damage, but my Earthquake knocks it out. From here, I've got answers to our remaining Pokémon. Icy Wind for Murkrow, and my final PP of Earthquake for Gengar. I probably should have used a PP up. It's champion time, and for this fight, Piloswine is of course holding the Nevermelt Ice. Gyarados is first. I use Return on it, it does over half damage, Gyarados sets up Rain Dance, and then I knock it out the next turn. And then, because I'm an Ice type, Lance chooses to send out Charizard while it's raining. I love that the AI doesn't have a check for weather in these games. And for my sake, it's really good that it doesn't, because Flamethrower hits me and does a lot of damage, and then Piloswine doesn't manage to knock the Charizard out. So that's really bad. If I'd had to face this Flaming Lizard without rain on the field, I don't think that I could have done it at this level. But today I'm proceeding with Orange Health. Lance sends out his Ace Dragonite next, and luckily here I outspeed and knock it out with a single Icy Wind. 
That bodes very well for the following two Dragonite. But before them, I need to face Lance's Aerodactyl. It outspeeds me with Ancient Power and gets a massive critical hit, taking Powerswine down to 12 health. I really need Icy Wind to one-hit it. But it doesn't, and the Aerodactyl survives with a small amount of health left. And then my lucky stars align, and Aerodactyl's speed gets lowered by Icy Wind. This allows me to outspeed on the next turn and knock it out. All that's left are the final two Dragonites, and as was the case before, I knocked them both out in a single hit. I was slightly worried that Icy Wind would miss, but it didn't. And with that, Wine's done it. It's defeated the first portion of the game with a time of 1 hour, 58 minutes, and 34 seconds. Now, I'm moving on to Kanto. I was so excited about my trip to this new region that I completely forgot to get Ice Beam at the Tutor in Johto. So I guess I'm going to have to come back for that later. On the SS Aqua, there's actually a bed that you can rest in. So, this is different than in Generation 1. In the SSN, there's no heal bed. <laughs> Trust me. Sabrina is the first Kanto gym leader that I choose to face. I was feeling confident, and then Espeon hits me with a sand attack right out of the gate. I manage it and the following Mr. Mime, but then Alakazam sets up Reflect. It survives my Earthquake, heals itself with Recover, and then hits me with massive damage with Psychic. Am I gonna lose this fight? Uh, yep, I, I am. So I adjusted my strategy slightly by giving Piloswine the Soft Sand to hold. This improves my damage, but Espeon still messes with me with Sand Attack. Alakazam doesn't set up Reflect this time though, so I knock it out with Earthquake. So that's a lucky victory. Now it's time for the Rapid Fire Rocket Plotline. Head east of Cerulean, enter the center out of Rock Tunnel, talk to the manager of the power plant, fly back to Cerulean City, find the machine part in Misty's Gym, teleport back to Rock Tunnel, talk to the manager, teleport back to Rock Tunnel, go through Rock Tunnel, PP up, my favorite, receive the radio card. Before Surge, I grab the rare candy, and when I'm in here I see the little polka doll and I remember that I should be getting the magnet pass. I do so, and then I take him on. Earthquake's just great against his entire team. After that, I head back to Johto and teach Piloswine Ice Beam. This is the most powerful ice move it's going to learn. And note that you can't get this move if you're playing gold or silver because the move tutor doesn't exist in those games. That's just one of the perks of playing Crystal. Erica's easy, she gives me Giga Drain. Brock's next. I use Ice Beam against his Rock Ground type Pokemon and Earthquake against his Rock Water Pokemon. Blaine gets taken out with Earthquake, and here's some live audio for Janine. There's a little tune playing in the background. It's my uh, washing machine. It plays a little song when it's done. It's kind of cute. Like my girlfriend. Sean mentioned when we were reviewing Generation 1 footage that the Earth Badge actually looks like a feather, and uh, blue starts with a Pidgeot, so I think everything is like starting to make sense now. The Pigeon is a one-hit with Ice Beam, and Gyarados follows. Return connects and does more than half damage because of a critical hit. Blue sets a Brain Dance, and then heals before I'm able to knock it out. This is bad, because without a critical hit, I can't knock it out, and that allows it to get one Hydro Pump off before he heals it again. I need it to be in 2 hit range, or I'm not going to be able to get past it without that lock that I got with the critical hit. I want to avoid using my rare candies right now so that I can preserve them for red. I am so close after all, so I do some training until Piloswine is level 64 and then I attempt blue for the second time. Ice Beam takes Pidgeot down in 1 hit, and then Gyarados follows. I get a critical hit turn 1 again in this fight, blue heals with a full restore in response, my second return does half damage, and then I finish it off, so I don't need luck here anymore. Alakazam's next. It moves first with Reflect, my Earthquake connects but doesn't quite get the job done. This was Blue's chance to hit me, uh, and then he uses Disable. It fails and then Alakazam faints. Well done AI, well done. Executor is a one hit with Ice Beam, leading to his ace Arcanine. Earthquake doesn't finish it off, giving it the chance to use Flamethrower which does just over half damage to me. But that's not enough, and even with a full restore, Blue can't heal and save his fiery doggo. Last is Rhydon, but it has terrible special defense so Ice Beam finishes the fight. Red is last. This is the ultimate test. I've decided to immediately use my rare candies before I face him to minimize my real time spent playing. If it turns out that this fight is easy with so many levels, I'll just test to determine what the lowest level I can beat him at is. He opens with Pikachu, and this is sort of a mix between a blessing and a curse for Piloswine. Because for once, Thunder is actually useless. However, it can use Charm and lower my attack. But this time it misses, and my Earthquake knocks it out in one hit. Charizard's next. I select Return, it connects with Flamethrower, and does so much damage. At that damage range, there is no way that I can defeat it, so I need a different approach here. When I was using my rare candies to level up from level 64 to level 74, Piloswine started to learn Amnesia, and this move is going to be perfect for the Charizard. Raising my special defense against Pikachu is risky for only one reason. It can set up Charm more than once, ruining my attack. 
With six stages of special defense boosts, Flamethrower doesn't do that much damage, and I can knock Charizard out over three turns. Blastoise is next. However, I've only got 37 hit points left, and there's no way for me to heal. So this fight might be over, but there's a clear solution. <laughs> and I'm sure you've guessed it already. Rest. The strategy is the same here. Set up on Pikachu, use Ice Beam against Charizard for two reasons. Uh, one, I might get a freeze, which would be really nice, and the other is that I can avoid the attack drops that Charm caused. Then Blastoise is next, and here I can heal pretty consistently, because it's going to use at least one turn to set up Rain Dance. From there, I knock it out with Earthquake, and Red chooses Espeon next. It likes to set up Reflect, so I play slowly and heal, allowing me to knock it out and have Reflect fade when Snorlax comes out. That's really convenient. I use Ice Beam first here, just in case it freezes, and because Snorlax loves to use Amnesia first turn. After that, I start using Earthquake and knock the Sleepy Bear out in two hits. Venusaur is last. Ice Beam's super effective and it almost knocks it out. Then it prepares Solar Beam, but I outspeed and finish the fight, clocking in with a time of 2 hours, 35 minutes, and 58 seconds. Piloswine defeated Red at level 74. I reset 14 times throughout the playthrough and I achieved a game time of 9 hours and 26 minutes. But was this final fight consistent? That question always lingers in my mind after I finish these videos, so I've made it a habit to test the fight and see. The way that I'm going about this now is that I'll replay the fight at the same level with the same moveset and the same held item 10 times and see what the win-loss ratio would be. So how do you think it went with this state? Well, here are the results. And I actually played this fight a total of 11 times because one of them I lost because I failed to heal when Ice Beam froze Charizard. So that's just player error, and I think it kind of skews the test results if I don't play another fight just in that case. Of the 12 fights that I did against Red, I only won 3 times. And of the 10 fights that I did as part of the test, I only won 2. In this chart you can see each test battle and then the important events that occurred at each Pokemon along the way. Events that aided me are colored in green, and events that favored red are, well, <laughs> they're red. First of all, I need to acknowledge that Pikachu missed Charm far too many times in these tests. Six misses out of 11 uses. It's worth noting that the AI has a 25% chance to miss all status moves, that's hard-coded into these games, but that means that around seven or eight Charms should have connected, not just five. So I got lucky in this way. However, I did win on the only instance where Pikachu used Charm twice, but that was because of a turn 1 freeze against Snorlax, so I really don't think that that's a repeatable result. Every other time that Charm connected, I lost. The biggest factor contributing to most of the losses was critical hits. I lost 5 out of 10 times because of these. And there isn't really a great way for me to make these less likely. But I do think that there are ways for me to make this more consistent. Significantly so, actually. The first test that I tried was to use Nevermelt Ice as my held item and keep everything else the same. Of the 10 fights that I tested this way, I only won 6, and Charm connected significantly more in this batch. Losses again were primarily because of Red's critical hits, but also because Snorlax paralyzed me with Body Slam twice. I did try this with the held item of a Paralyzed Cure Berry, but that just wasn't working very well, so I decided against it. The loss of damage from Never Melt Ice just wasn't good. So this gives me a 60% chance to win, and that's really not what I want. I'd like something more consistent, like 90% or 100%. So if I take Charizard into two hit range, it will hit me one less time each fight, minimizing the number of times that it has a chance to roll for a critical hit. So I tried the fight again at level 76, hoping that this would be the case. And it actually is, just not all the time. But in this batch of fights, I actually lost eight times, and I only managed to win twice, so this is really not great. I guess I was just getting better luck previously. If leveling up isn't making things more consistent, then I don't think that the held item or my level is the problem. It's probably my moveset. So the next test that I decided to do was with Curse. And I chose the moveset Curse, Return, Rest, and Earthquake with Soft Sand as a held item. The issue with this moveset is that Red just gets critical hits far too often, and it doesn't really do anything to address them. Oh, and he also gets burns? Yeah, this was the very next fight. Like, it's so frustrating losing twice in a row like this. However, on the third fight, none of these unfortunate events happened, and I got to Blastoise, but then it outspeeds me because, of course, I've used Curse so many times I'm so slow. I abandoned this test in favor of adding Amnesia back in the place of Earthquake. Having more special defense is just going to be really helpful. So then I went with the moveset Amnesia, Rest, Curse, and Return with a pink bow to boost Return's power. I don't need Earthquake against anything really in this fight, it's only super effective against the Pikachu, so Return is a good substitute that can still hit Charizard. So here's how this moveset plays out. Set up Curse on Pikachu, maxing out your attack and defense stats. This minimizes the damage from Quick Attack and will prevent Snorlax's Body Slam from doing much damage later in the fight. It also powers up Return, so Piloswine will do maximum damage. Curse also provides a tool to regain lost attack should Pikachu use Charm, so that basically invalidates that move, 
which Red likes to use pretty much every first turn. Curse only has 10 PP, meaning that if I don't use any PP ups on it, if the Pikachu uses Charm three or more times, I'll have to fight without maxed attack. With Curse fully set up, I use Amnesia to prepare for Charizard's Flamethrower. All this time, Pikachu's just whittling away at me with Quick Attack, and it sometimes gets critical hits. They're kind of funny, they do very little still. Uh, but all this doesn't matter because I can just recover with rest. Charizard's next. Here, I need to cross my fingers and hope that it doesn't get a critical hit, because it's gonna obviously outspeed me. If it does get a crit, I lose. If it doesn't though, I survive and then return one hits it. The following Blastoise outspeeds, but it uses Rain Dance, and there's a reason that it does this. It sees my health, and it knows that Surf will not knock me out faster if it doesn't set up. So it sets up, and that gives me actually one turn to hit it, and that allows me to knock it out with Return. So just going into the Blastoise fight with more health after Charizard is the thing that I need to make that part of the fight more consistent. Espeon's next, and Psychic does like very little to me, so the only thing I'm worried about here is a critical hit with Psychic. After that, Snorlax comes out, it uses Amnesia first turn, for the same reason that Blastoise used Rain Dance first turn, and then Venusaur's last, and really it thinks that Solar Beam is more effective, because it doesn't know that it takes two turns essentially. I'd be more worried if it sometimes tried Giga Drain first turn, but it never did against me. So with this strategy, I win 6 out of 10 times. Yeah, still only 6 out of 10 times. All four of the losses being the result of a critical hit from either Charizard or Espeon. Previously, I might have been satisfied with this result and stopped, but today I'm being really stubborn, and I'm convinced that I can get this to like 9 out of 10 fights at level 76. Because of how much curse boosts my attack already, I don't think that the pink bow is required. A quick claw could reduce the number of times that red gets critical hits, because occasionally I'll move first against Charizard or Espeon. And I was right. With this strategy, I'm able to win 9 times out of 10. So I think that the move set that I used here is the most consistent. Amnesia, Rest, Curse, Return, and using a Quick Claw. What do you think? Did I miss anything? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo. A huge shout out to all my patrons who make this content possible. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.